rejoice and be glad. Amen. Dear fellow worshippers of our Lord Jesus Christ, I think you agree with me that one of the most important skills a person can learn in life is good time management. Because let's be honest, everyone wants your time. Your boss wants your time. Your spouse and kids want your time. Even you want your time. The key, of course, is finding a good balance between work and home and rest. So we carve out different parts of our day and our week, and we set those aside being off limits. We protect them from any encroachment. You might say those times are sacred to us. Well, today as we dig into the third commandment, let's note that God demands that each of us sets aside some sacred time for him. Sacred time to rest and remember the Lord our God. We'll read from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor daughter, nor your manservant, or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. This is the law of the Lord. When we think about those two words, resting and remembering today, it turns out that they give us a great insight into the minds and hearts of God's people to whom Moses spoke these words. You see, God's people were ready for some rest. They had spent the last 40 years wandering through the wilderness. And now they were camped on that east side of the Jordan River. They were getting ready to enter the promised land of Canaan. And Moses then seized this opportunity that he had to give God's people a sermon. That sermon is actually the entire book of Deuteronomy in which he reviewed all of God's commands and he told and warned God's people many times that they should not let the rest they were about to receive distract them, take away from remembering the Lord their God. Now surely you and I can identify with the Israelites, can we? We may not have spent the last 40 years wandering through the wilderness, but the daily demands, the difficulties of life, the hardship, the heartbreak, death, all those things can make us feel like we've been wandering through a wasteland. Even the type A personalities among us will all agree that we need rest sometimes. Now, physical rest is pretty easy for us to spot. You can tell that we need physical rest when we can't track a conversation or keep our eyes open. When the kids get more cranky and more wound up, well, then it's time for some rest. But even our need for physical rest can sneak up on us, can't it? They were gone to the doctor with a long list of aches and pains only to receive the stunning diagnosis. You need some rest. You just can't keep going on like this. Now our need for physical rest is a no-brainer. By nature, our need for spiritual rest isn't even on our radar. Because by nature we were born corrupted by sin. We are inherently unspiritual, dead, desensitized, and blind to the spiritual things of God. 
You might say that we're not born equipped with a spiritual gas gauge that tells us that we're running on empty and headed for hell. Well, that awareness only comes when the Holy Spirit puts a new spirit in our hearts through faith in Jesus Christ. But even with that new heart, we believers still struggle with sin. It still clings to us in our lives and daily deceives us. As evidence of that, consider how easily we look for spiritual rest in the mirages of material things. Maybe you spend a week at the cabin or on a cruise ship, and you come back and say, Oh boy, I'm all rested, all rejuvenated, my soul is all recharged. But Jesus and his word were nowhere in sight. Or just as foolishly, maybe even more so, we go to worship. We read God's word. We say our prayers without taking the commands and promises of God to heart. My friend, that's as foolish as imagining that we can get all the benefits of sleep by simply lying awake with our eyes closed. We simply cannot keep going on like this. We are so rest deprived that we need the Lord to prescribe spiritual rest for us, for our eternal good. That's exactly why God has given us the third commandment. God gave the third commandment originally to his people Israel, and in the Old Testament he told them exactly when, where, and how they were to rest. He said, set aside the last day of the week as the Sabbath day, from sunset on Friday evening to sunset on Saturday night. And God wanted that day to stand out among the Israelites and all the nations among which they lived. So he attached two special stipulations to the Sabbath day. The first one we heard in our reading. God says, you shall do no work. No one in Israel. Not the servants, not the children, not the temporary residents, not even the animals were to do any work or business. God gave them a weekly holiday, a day off. God recognized their need for physical rest, and so he designed the Sabbath to be a day of physical rest. But it wasn't just another day to do whatever one wanted. It was to be a Sabbath to the Lord your God. It was to be a holy, sacred day set aside for God and his glory. As Martin Luther tells us in his explanation to the third commandment in the large catechism, he says that in this sinful world, the only way that a day or a place or even people can be made holy is by being consecrated with the study of God's holy word. And so then the book of Leviticus, we find that other stipulation that God attached to the Sabbath day, He says it's to be a day of sacred assembly, a day of formal corporate worship. On Saturday morning, the Jewish community would gather together. They would read and study God's word. They would sing psalms and pray, all those things to help them remember how good God had been to them. Specifically, Moses tells them to remember that they were slaves in Egypt. And it's interesting, throughout this section, the word you that is used is actually you, a singular version. So if God is saying to each and every Israelite, remember that every one and each one of you were slaves in Egypt. But the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Every week, every believer was to step back and ponder how God's almighty power and great mercy had brought them from certain slavery and death in the land of Egypt to liberty and life in the promised land. 
The Sabbath day was to be a day of rest. A day of spiritual rest, remembering God's goodness. Now both of these commands, God's command of physical and spiritual rest, they weren't backwards looking, but rather they were forward facing. They were pictures, shadows, designed for God's people to look ahead to that greater rest that the Savior would bring to all people. But when the Savior finally got here, God's Sabbath and his worship in general was in a sorry state indeed. That's not to say the Sabbath wasn't being celebrated. It was most religiously. But not for the right reason and not in the right way. You see, the religious leaders of God's people had seized on to the letter of God's law, but they had let go of the spirit of what God intended. When in reality, we should have hung on to both. They taught God's people that if you keep God's command, and if you keep all these extra human traditions that we have made, then you'll be in God's good grace and favor. You will earn his forgiveness and his love. So they added human laws to God's law. Laws that said how little you could lift and how many steps you could take on the Sabbath day before you had broken it with work. So when the Pharisees denounced Jesus' disciples and said, how can they do what is unlawful on the Sabbath, Jesus had to rebuke them. Because they didn't recognize that the Sabbath was made for man. For our spiritual benefit, not man for the Sabbath, And Jesus could redirect them in this way because Jesus was the Lord of the Sabbath. As the Son of God, he was both the God who had given the command in the first place and the one who had come to perfectly fulfill that rest by giving real and eternal rest to all people. Jesus accomplished that rest. First of all, by obeying both the Spirit and the letter of God's Sabbath day command and all of God's commands in our place as our substitute. Jesus perfectly loved his Heavenly Father with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind. Jesus loved his neighbor, you and me, and every single fallen human being so much that he carried the guilt of our sin to the cross. And when he was nailed to the wood, and died for our sins. He left our punishment hanging there. The Apostle Paul put it this way in our second lesson. He says that he forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that still opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. Dear Christians, you realize what this means? Jesus Christ has fulfilled every single one of the law's requirements. By his innocent death, he has canceled God's law forever. The law accomplished its condemning work at the cross. When it convicted and counted Jesus Christ as guilty of the crimes of all humanity. That means that God's law no longer stands against you and me. That means as far as God's concerned, he doesn't see your sin. You are forgiven. You are set free. Your heart and conscience can finally be at rest. Now that's a freedom that is so profound that this world can't even know it. Because when it comes to sin and guilt, the only thing that this world knows how to do is to hide it. To bury it, to cover it up, uh, to pretend it's not so bad, to drown it out. It's only in Christ 
that our sin, guilt, shame, all that, forever taken away, forgiven. God has truly given us real rest in our Savior Jesus. And every reason to worship Him by remembering how His undeserved mercy and kindness has saved us. So now, when it comes to worshiping God, the real question for us is, what now? Because Jesus, before of all those Old Testament shadows and pictures, God no longer limits us as to where, when, and how we are to worship Him. We are truly free to worship God whenever, wherever, and however we want. Now maybe you say to yourself, I didn't put this freedom thing to the test. Pastor Roloff, are you telling me that I don't have to come to worship every week? No, you don't. You don't have to come to worship once a week, or twice a month, or 12 times a year. You don't have to attend Bible study either. But with all that Jesus has done for you, why wouldn't you want to? Why wouldn't you want to gather with fellow unbelievers and praise and glorify the God of your salvation and hear his word of grace? Why wouldn't you want to despise that word of God that has forgiven you? and made you holy. Why only get rest once a week when you can get rest every single day through God's word of promise and prayer? Dear Christians, let's admit that freedom can be a rather scary thing for us because real freedom means that the answer is always Yes. You are free to worship God whenever and wherever you want. Yes, you are free to worship God when you wake up in the morning, when you're on your drive into work, when you're talking with your friends, when you tuck your kids into bed at night. Yes, you are free to worship God with your requests, with your hearts, with your words, with your actions, with your music, with your art. You are free to praise God with organ and piano and clarinet and drums and dancing and electric guitar. Yes, you are free. Praise God for the great freedom and liberty that he has given us to worship him in his glory. Dear Christians, when is your time to rest and remember the Lord your God? I pray that the opportunities for Bible study and worship that we have here at Ascension are truly meaningful and special for you. But please don't let yourself be limited to our schedule. For the love of your souls and the praise of your Savior, set aside some sacred time wherever and whenever to go to the Lord your God and get some rest. Amen. May we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. We'll join the scene the Create in Me.